I have been engaged in research at this institute for 44 years. During that time, some of that research has focused on the issue of cycling, the role that it plays, how cycling compares with other means of getting around the car, public transport, walking and so on, where the train can play a role in combination with cycling, um, the problems associated with how it is that cycling is playing such a minor role in total travel patterns of people in this country, to look at the implications of that uh, and then to go on to prescribe uh, ways whereby things could be considerably improved to the much wider public benefit. I find it quite remarkable uh, that in looking at the different modes of transport, both from a personal perspective and from a public interest perspective, the bicycle stands head and shoulders above other means of getting around. From a personal point of view, it's hugely advantageous because it is a method of travel that caters for all groups in the population, ranging from children to old people. It may surprise people to know that in the Netherlands, where proper provision is made for it, um, that about a quarter of the journeys of old age pensioners are made by bicycle and about a third of the journeys of children are made by it. So in that country, it is not seen as a dangerous form of travel. It is also salutary to note the fact uh, that in 1950, in this country, cycle mileage exceeded car mileage so that that change in the last 50 years or so has come about um, by virtue of the decisions made in government, central government and local government and through the process of cultural changes which have encouraged people to look on cycling as a dangerous form of travel and the inadvisability of catering for it because it was then thought it would simply lead to more casualties because of that danger. From a personal point of view, it's advantageous also from the point of view of travel time and speed. Cycling, typically at about 10 miles an hour, is a remarkable way of getting to destinations as distant as five or six miles um, at that speed and on a door-to-door -door basis. If one then goes on to look at the public interest or the societal benefits of cycling, one comes across again a range of reasons for thinking that the bicycle certainly should be promoted. The costs of provision for it by the creation of cycle networks or by the control of vehicle speed and so on um, is uh, much, much lower than it is in catering for people travelling by car or public transport or the train. Uh, so beneficial in that regard. It also doesn't cause noise or pollution like motor vehicles do. Um, and moreover, um, it's quite extraordinary in so far as it doesn't generate danger, which motorised vehicles do. They make people feel unsafe, particularly people who feel responsible for others, like responsible for old people or for children getting around. There is a further justification for promoting cycling, within which from other research that I've been engaged in is far, far more important than any other consideration, and that is climate change. In spite of the fact that nobody really wants to know too much about it because of the implications of the rising concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, there is no doubt whatsoever uh, that the society is going to have to dramatically cut back on its Activities which are dependent upon the burning of fossil fuels and of transport is, of course, a particular case in point because so much of uh, so many journeys, it's about three quarters of journeys are within five miles, which is a sort of 30 minute uh, cycle ride. 
in a very short space of time, people will see and governments will see that carbon rationing is going to have to be introduced as a fair means of regulating the amount of fossil fuels we burn. And when people see how small that ration is, they are instinctively going to see that the bicycle is one significant way of cutting back on those, that use of fossil fuels, which is the, the source of power in the engines of cars and buses and trains. Why is it that cycling plays such a small role in total travel in the UK? In fact, only 2% of journeys are made in this way, whereas in comparable countries like, the Den like Denmark and Netherlands, uh, a much higher proportion. Recent surveys have shown that in the Netherlands, 43% of the population use a bicycle every day. That is quite remarkable because countries like the Netherlands and Denmark have a comparable culture, a comparable um, level of income, comparable levels of car ownership. So it is remarkable and it needs to be explained. Now that is a subject that I've looked at in some detail and I think the explanation lies in a number of misunderstandings uh, and in effect myths about the disadvantages of cycling which acts to spur people to think that they're safer and they're better off if they have a car. Cycling is so advantageous from a personal viewpoint and from a public interest viewpoint, given that it imposes the least costs on society as compared with travel by motorised means, that one can well ask why is it then that more people don't cycle? I think that is explained by the fact that um, there are a number of misconceptions amongst people who don't cycle about cycling and it acts, oh, they act together as a deterrent to taking up cycling. Given the considerable advantages of, of the bicycle, uh, both from a personal viewpoint and from a public perspective in that the cycling imposes relatively little cost on society at large, one can wonder why more people don't take up cycling. I think the explanation for this is because people who don't cycle subscribe to a number of misconceptions about what cycling entails. Uh, let me illustrate that with a few references. Uh, firstly, it's thought by non-cyclists that cycling is only appropriate for short journeys or shorter journeys like walking. In practice, of course, uh, within the space of, uh, let's say, half an hour, one can cover easily uh, five or six miles on a bicycle. And of course, it is door-to-door -door travel uh, as opposed, for instance, with public transport, a journey that has to uh, walk, that has to be made to the bus stop and at the other end of the journey. Uh, and moreover, National Travel Survey statistics show that uh, of journeys made uh, at present, um, about 40% are made within two miles and about three quarters are made within five miles so that one can see that whilst of course cycling can't cater for all journeys it can cater for a majority of the journeys that most people make. A second view of people who don't cycle is that it is only an appropriate method of travel for people who are fit like young people rather than older people. But the reality is far from that. Oh, where cycling is part of uh, uh, the perception of one of the primary means of getting around, for instance, as can be seen in the Netherlands or in Denmark, um, in fact, so very surprisingly, one in four of the journeys of old age pensioners are made by bicycle. And it is because in those countries, safe cycle networks have been created. In fact, it illustrates the uh, obvious view that uh, cycling is perceived to be a dangerous form of travel. We can easily change that. 
many non-cyclists think that it's fine to cycle, but <laughs> only when it's fine, when it's not raining or it's very cold. Again, one needs to cite the statistics. In fact, it only rains on about one in a hundred of the of journeys of about 10 minutes in this country. In other words, the chances of it, being, of it raining when one is cycling are very small indeed. And the other concern is uh, that it entails so much effort as to be a huge disincentive to taking up cycling, uh, particularly in hilly areas. But it needs to be pointed out that most urban areas are flat, uh, or relatively flat, and on top of that, one needs to recognise uh, that hills go down as well as up. Uh, and perhaps one could add the rider there uh, that um, cyclists aren't glued to their saddle, so if the hill is too steep to conveniently and comfortably cycle up it, you can always get off your bike and push it for that extra 50 yards or whatever it is to get over that. A further view of non-cyclists is that it entails so much effort that after a cycle journey you you will have sweated and you need to have a bath or take a shower. In practice, if you speak to uh, cyclists, you'll find it extremely rare for them to feel the need for that, not because they don't mind smelling, but simply uh, because you don't sweat, you cycle at a speed which you find comfortable, unless of course you're engaged in recreational cycling where you're uh, uh, cycling as fast as possible. In practice too, <laughs> one can point out that where showers are available, as for instance in uh, universities for uh, catering for students, uh, that the shower is very, very rarely used for that purpose. It is thought that cycling isn't really very attractive because the cyclist has to breathe in the polluted air from motor vehicles. In practice, of course, cyclists can always get up to the front of the queue by traffic lights, um, uh, number one. Number two, uh, uh, perhaps it's poetic justice, but in fact, uh, drivers of motor vehicles have to breathe in those same fumes and are far more likely to suffer from that because they have to sit in queues at traffic lights breathing in the exhaust fumes from the vehicle in front of them. In fact, cycling is so ad advantageous from a health point of view uh, that uh, uh, studies have shown that cyclists are typically uh, about uh, as fit as people 10 years younger than themselves. That does very well illustrate how beneficial it is for uh, health, providing one can tie in cycling to one's daily routine, going to work or going to school, going to visit friends or for re recreational purposes. It is generally thought also uh, that cycling is slower than travel by motorised means. In practice, in urban areas, the cycle is faster because the cyclist can go from door to door uh, without the uh, added journey or short journey to get to the, the station or the stop. So faster uh, than most um, journeys by um, bus but over and above that also uh, because of all that is entailed in dry driving and again in urban areas for instance the problems of parking it is again and has been shown in comparison tra uh, travels uh, in urban areas that the cycle is generally somewhat faster than even the car. Another um, uh, view is that um, the creation of cycle networks is something that really in this in these years of austerity we cannot afford. But the provision for cycling in terms of a network of safe routes is far cheaper uh, than road construction and far cheaper than providing um, public transport services. Uh, in fact, uh, statistics again show uh, that one can create uh, a cycle network, a safe cycle network over many, many miles and the cost of it you know, uh, would compare with just uh, a, a, a few metres of uh, motorway construction or of uh, f for the provision of uh, bus services. In addition to the fact that 
cycling does cater for the or can cater for the majority of journeys because they're in, within reasonable walking distance. One could add the rider uh, that, of course, when the bicycle is combined with train travel, um, which is uh, very often a, a, a reasonable alternative uh, to using the car, then one can see uh, that the speed of travel and the distances that can be travelled are far, far greater. A, 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 cycle, a cycle ride you know, to the station, put the bicycle on the train, and then at the far end, take the bike off and ride off on a door-to-door -door basis. It is an extraordinarily convenient way of uh, travelling over long distances, and on top of it, of course, it does uh, enable one to uh, have that the pleasure of getting some exercise after sitting on the train for a long journey. Many non-cyclists um, uh, state that they don't want to cycle because cycling is dangerous. And of course, in reality, it's not the bicycle, it's not the cycling that is dangerous, it is the threat posed by motor vehicles. So again, here are strong grounds for creating safe cycle networks. The danger stems, as I say, from uh, uh, motor vehicles and that provides further justification uh, for for the benefit of pedestrians as well as cyclists to have lower speed limits which hardly add to the, the time taken on any motorised journey. The reality is that in a 30 mile an hour speed limit you don't drive at 30 miles an hour, um, you drive at a much average lower speed uh, than the 30. So the difference in, as has been again shown in surveys, the difference between the time taken within a uh, with a 20 mile an hour and a 30 mile an hour urban speed limit is very little indeed. As far as danger is concerned, even within the rather poor conditions created for cycling in this country or the paucity of uh, provision, um, one could add the, again the statistic which is quite uh, uh, remarkable and encouraging which is uh, that cycle fatalities only occur on about one in 30 million kilometers of uh, 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 riding a cycle and uh, with serious injuries it's only about 1.5 million kilometres so it is still relatively safely and on top of that when you set that against the the um, uh, the uh, life years lost in in cycling one needs to set uh, the huge benefits in terms of life years um, by virtue of one being fitter and therefore living longer. Perhaps the last point that is worth mentioning is that relating to safety helmets. People who don't cycle, uh, and even an increasing number of cyclists, uh, think that it is necessary for their survival in, on, on, on the roads to wear a safety helmet. In practice, the safety cycle helmet is only capable of protecting one's head if one falls off a bike. It could not be to protect oneself in, if, in the event of a collision with a motor vehicle because then it would have to be as stout as the, uh, cycle, as the uh, helmets worn by motorcyclists. But it's really worthwhile noting, again from statistics, hard evidence, uh, that um, half of the motorcyclists' uh, deaths are um, as a result of head injury, even although all of them are obliged by law to wear uh, motorcycle helmets. Uh, uh, and the other point is that statistics show that of cycle fatalities and serious injuries, 85% of them occur as a result of being hit by a motor vehicle, as I say, for which they're not designed. It's salutary to note that in the Netherlands and in Denmark, very few cyclists wear helmets. And why? It's simply because uh, proper provision is made for them uh, so that they don't run or run or run a very small risk of having to uh, cross paths with motor vehicles, the primary source of head injury among cyclists.
one can discuss the implications of the findings of this research uh, from the point of view of public policy. That can be considered in the context of two aspects. Uh, number one is whether the cy cycling is to be recommended in spite of the dangers associated with it or whether it should be promoted from a health perspective in view of the fact that it enables people to maintain their fitness throughout life. Finally, I think I could say, make two, point, two or three points. Um, firstly, it is that we really need a major cultural shift in this country now, uh, not 50 years ago, but now, by virtue of this misinformation about cycling and its dangers. Ask any man or woman in the street and they will tell you that I haven't taken up cycling because I look on it as dangerous. Ask any parents whether they will allow their children to cycle to school, which is the preferred method of travel and indeed the only means of mechanised travel available to children. And those parents will say, no, 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 I won't let my son or daughter uh, cycle to school or to visit their friends. The roads are too dangerous. So we are denying children in this instance. We're denying them the opportunity of keeping their fitness. And then we wring our hands about the fact that they are getting overweight. I do believe uh, that pride of place should be given to the cycle in, in transport policy for all the reasons that I've stated. And perhaps one could, in a jocular way, observe that the only disadvantage of cycling is that it was invented about 120 to 140 years before its time. Can you imagine if we didn't have a bicycle and somebody came along with this new invention? It's a two-wheel vehicle. Uh, it costs very little. You can maintain it yourself. It makes you fit. Uh, um, it's cheap to provide for. It, it doesn't cause danger or hardly any danger to other people. It enables you to travel five miles in half an hour. Um, it's a means of combating what is certainly the most serious threat to our futures, namely climate change, because it doesn't use any fossil fuels. And you see there a form of transport which would be welcomed and certainly would win outright the competition of the greatest invention of all time.